What's up, everybody? Welcome to another edition of High Mythology, the show where we get higher than a phoenix in a firestorm and uh, tell you guys some classic mythology slash folklore stories. Uh, today, we're going to be doing some Italian folklore. Nice. Yeah, people are excited about this. <laughs> <laughs> Are they? They're virtually excited. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, why don't you go ahead and take it away, Kimbo? Um, Yo. Get on into it. So for once, I think I got these names down because of my Duolingo for the past year. Yeah, yeah. And actually being able to pronounce most of these names. Okay. So. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, anyway, so first I'm up. Sorry, getting ahead of myself there. <laughs> I also apologize about all of the jokes, uh, the Little John jokes. Sorry if they get repetitive. <laughs> yeah. This one's called Dauntless Little John. So yeah! Da- <laughs> <laughs> there once was a young man named Dauntless Little John. He got his name because he was not afraid of anything. While traveling about the world, he came to an inn and asked for lodging. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the innkeeper tells him, I'm sorry, but we have no rooms available. But if you're not afraid, I can direct you to a certain palace where you can stay. Little John curiously yeah. asks, <laughs> Why should I be afraid? The innkeeper leans in what? closer. <laughs> as if to whisper and says, People shake at the thought of that palace. Anyone who has ever gone in has never come out alive. Okay. <laughs> in the morning, the friars will go up t- on their Go up with their wagon for anyone brave enough to stay the night inside. So they carry the, you know, they came up there to get the bodies so they can have a peaceful burial and shit. Ah, uh, they're just burying the bodies? Yeah. Oh, well, they skeet, hear some, skeet, some motherfucker. Little... <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dauntless Little John did not he- hesitate. He buys from the innkeeper a lamp, a bottle of wine, and a sausage. He leaves and marches straight for the palace. At midnight, he was sitting at the table eating and drinking when suddenly he heard heard the voice come from the chimney. Shall I throw it down, it says. Yeah! (laughs) Go ahead, says Little John. (laughs) Down the chimney, into the fireplace, fell a man's leg. Little John finished his first glass of wine and pours himself another one. Shot, 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 shot. Then the voice speaks again. (laughs) Shall I throw it down? Okay. <laughs> Little John shrugs and says, sure, why not? And so another leg falls down the chimney. Little John bites into a sausage and the voice falls down. <laughs> sausage, 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 sausage. <laughs> Shall I throw it down? Little John starts yeah. to whistle. Do as you please, says Little John. And then an arm falls down and the voice again says, Shall oh, I throw skeet, it down? <laughs> <laughs> By all means, cries Little John. And then another arm came down. Shall I throw it down? The voice calls. Yes. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. Says little John. Okay. (laughs) Then came down the trunk of the body. The arms and legs find their way to the body and attach themselves. The headless corpse (laughs) stands up. Shall I throw it down? The voice asks once more. Little John yells out. What are you waiting for? Throw it down. And down came the head and it sprang onto place on top of the body. Okay. He was truly a giant. And little John raised his glass and said, to your health. Shot, <laughs> shot, 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 shot. You're getting a little carried away. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. I do get everybody. You're like shaking the table. The shaking the table. I just, I'm shaking the salt off. Jesus Christ. Um, you got me. I need to light this joy. <laughs> You're too much sometimes. <laughs> too much. How do I marry you? <laughs> yeah, bad luck. Just kidding. No. Um, let's see. Where am I? Shot. Spraying himself on top of his body, he raises his glass and says, "To your health." The giant says, while pointing, "Take that lamp and come with me." Little John picked up that lamp, but he did not budge. "You go first," says the giant. "No, no." After you, insisted Little John. After you, thundered the giant. Little John raises his voice a bit. Please, I insist you lead the way. So the giant went first, with Little John behind him, lighting the way. 
They went through room after room until they had walked the whole length of the palace. Beneath one of the staircase was a small door. Open it, ordered the giant. No, you should open it, says Little John. No! <laughs> oh, that's a great song. Who's that by? Prof? Uh, yeah. Uh, no! <laughs> Shout out. I like your music. So the giant shoved the door open with his shoulder, revealing a spiral staircase going down. Go down, directed the giant. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, no. After you, I insist, says Little John. No. They went down the steps that led to the cellar. The giant points to a large stone slab and says, pick it up. Little John whistles a little tune after he says, no. To the window. You pick it up. <laughs> so you pick it up. <laughs> the giant lifts it, it like as if it were a mere house. pebble. And beneath the slab were three pots of gold. Carry those upstairs, ordered the giant. You carry them up, says little John. <laughs> you do it, fucker. <laughs> and so the giant brings the three pots of gold upstairs, one by one. And when they get back to the room with the great fireplace, the giant turns to John and says, Little John, the spell has been broken. And as okay. the giant was <laughs> talking, one of his legs came off and shot up the chimney. <laughs> one of these pots of gold is for you. And then one of his arms fell off to the floor and then crawled its way up the chimney. The second pot of gold is for the friars who come to carry the dead away. And the giant's other arm falls off and follows the other arm up. Okay. The third pot of gold is for the first poor man who comes by. And then the giant's last leg flies off up the chimney, leaving the giant seated on the floor. Keep this palace for yourself. And with that set, the body of the giant vanishes. The owners of this palace and their children have all left this world forever. And then the giant's head crumbled away. And in its ashes was the deed to the palace and the lands. When, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when morning arose, chants from the friars could be heard. Misere me, misere me, misere me. The friars came to the palace with their wagon to carry off little John's body. But there he stood at the window smoking his pipe. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Just like I do. Dauntless little John was a wealthy youth indeed. With all those gold pieces, he lived happily for many decades. Did he keep all three bags, that fucker? <laughs> no, he did, as he was told. They were big, okay. giant yeah. pots of gold. He, The giant even had to carry them up one by one. Oh, shit. So you know what I mean? So, unfortunately, sometime after his 60th year, he was walking about his palace and suddenly turned around and saw his shadow. He was so frightened, he died. Call the end. Cancer. Odd little story, huh? Yeah. All right, just yeah. jump. We want to just join. Okay. <laughs> yeah. It was a. Uh, oh, uh, little John. Don't, don't always do as you're told. And then one day he saw his shadow and he shat himself to death. Was he part mouse? He was. Part rabbit? Part turkey. Part turkey. Part ostrich? Dauntless little turkey was the original story. <laughs> Okay. They changed it after the rapper Little John came about. <laughs> nice. Okay. <laughs> I think these stories came from 1842. Okay. And like before, like, I'm actually not entirely sure. Like, it's a guy. I know. I think a couple of them talk about guns even, don't they? <clears throat> yeah. 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 So it has to be like after. I mean, guns were around from 1776. Well, 1600s. They use it for the Civil War. I think it's for the 1600s. Revolution. I don't I'm know. We'll save history. that for a podcast with historians, which is not this one. This is high people and mythology. <coughs> and folktales and, and fairy folk tales. tales and everything else. <clears throat> All right, so let's just fairy jump folk. into the next one. Dive right in. This one's called The Man Wreathed in Seaweed. Ew. Okay. Japanese would have liked it. They would have called him Nori Man. Mm, Nori Man, we eat him. Should call him Swamp Thing. Swamp Thing. A king had his criers announce to the town square that whoever found his missing daughter would be rewarded with a fortune. However, the announcements brought no results, and since no one had any idea of the girl's whereabouts, she had been kidnapped nearly a year ago, and they had already looked the world over for her. A sea captain had a fabulous idea, he thought. That since she wasn't on land, she may be trapped out at sea. So he gets in his ship, 
his ship into top shape. But when it came to sign top up, shape, ship. the crew, not one sailor would step forward. No one wanted to go on such a dangerous expedition. There was no telling of how long it would last. The captain waited on the pier, but everyone was fearful of being the first to embark, so no one approached his ship. A man by the name of Sanfier Starboard. <laughs> Sanfier Starboard here. That's like a, you know, it's like Luke Skywalker. Yeah, it is. Sanfier Star. Sanfier Starboard. Sanfier Starboard. Walked over to the Folk captain. Hero. Oh, sorry. Ha <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> A short pause. He had a reputation of being a lazy sack of shit. He and no captain was ever willing to sign him up. I the once saw Sanfier Starboard eat a whole vessel of oysters. Didn't pay himself. for a single one. Vomited. Mm-hmm. I would. Yeah. I also once saw Get Sanfier Starboard reloaded. save the gar- galaxy, though. So. <laughs> The captain thought, if I can just get one person to sign up, the rest will follow. And so he goes to Samphire and says to him, listen, how would you like to sail with me? In a daze, Samphire said, I'd like that very much. Fuck it. (laughs) Others on the pier took notice of their conversation, and the captain saw them and raised his voice so that all could hear. Then come aboard, mate, and we will find the missing princess. Of this I'm certain. We will have her in a moment of weeks. The food and wine I have stocked the ship, you will find nowhere better. So Samphire was the first to embark. That's how you get them. Come get drunk on my party barge. (laughs) And after that speech, other sailors took it to heart and boarded the ship as well. Once he was on the ship, however, all Samphire did was stand around all day with his hands in his pocket while dreaming of the taverns he had left behind. The other sailors cursed him because they knew truly. (laughs) (laughs) The other sailors cursed him because they knew truly that there was no knowing of how long the voyage would last. I miss me purple fuckers. (laughs) (laughs) They want... I would definitely miss those. Oh, (laughs) God. Uh, They wanted their provisions to last, and he did nothing to earn his keep. So the captain, seeing morale low because of him, decides to get rid of him. He goes to Samphire and says... Do you see that little island over there? Pointing at an islet, isolated reef in the middle of the sea. Get into a rowboat and explore it. We'll be cruising right around here. So Samphire does as he was told. Go, go check out that little island over there. <laughs> and he gets in the rowboat and makes his way. As soon as he has left, the captain ordered the ship to set sail away at full speed, leaving poor Samphire stranded in the middle of the sea. As Samphire approached the reef, he brought his boat ashore and spotted a cave. He cautiously looks inside and, see, inside and sees a beautiful maiden tied up. Oh, hey. <laughs> it was none other than, but the king's missing daughter. She says to him, I am Princess Sophia. How did you manage to find me? Samphire lies and says, I was fishing for octopi. Octopies, girl. How did my joint go out so fast? You got me? I was looking for some octopeds out there, but I find me a biped, and I like bipeds, too. <laughs> so Sophia sadly says... Bipies. <laughs> I was kidnapped by a giant octopus, whose prisoner I now am. You must flee before it returns. Take note, though. For three hours a day, the giant octopus changes itself into a red mullet <laughs> that can be caught. But a glorious have... <laughs> red mullet on a real American head. I gotta think the Italian Mediterranean. I know, yeah. Sea. Mull- mullets yeah, are, that was the but they're shit. also a Those haircut. were like the prime uh-huh. over there. You uh-huh. know what I mean? And if you live in a trailer park, they still are. Okay, like the cod of the world, huh? Uh, no, the cod is the cock of the trailer park. <laughs> so for three hours a day, the giant will turn itself into a red mullet that can be caught, but you have to kill it right away, or it will turn into a seagull and fly away. So we're just going to keep on metamorphosing. Yeah. And then if you don't catch the seagull, it'll <laughs> turn into a goose that'll bite you in the balls. Uh, Samphire, Sapphire, Samphire, sorry, I guess I can't pronounce it. Samphire Starboard here. Samphire uh, left Traditional the princess hero. and took his boat. He waited out of sight on the reefs, and then suddenly from the sea emerged the giant octopus. 
It was so big that it could reach clear around the island with its tentacles. After about an hour, as the princess said, the giant octopus transformed into a red mullet and disappeared below the sea. Samphire lowered his fishing nets and then started to haul the nets back in. The nets were full of, uh, sorry, gurnard, sturgeon, and denix. His last haul produced the red mullet. Samphire lifted his oar to kill it, but as he was bringing the oar down, the red mullet transformed into a seagull. Squawk! His oar hit the seagull and broke its wing, but then the seagull transformed into a small octopus. Octopus. (laughs) whose wounded tentacles sprayed dark red blood everywhere. Samphire oh. was upon it, and in an instant he took his oar and beat the octopus to death. He is just using that oar for all it's worth. He returns to Princess Sophia, unties her, and tells her what has happened. I just beat that puss up, girl. <laughs> Once she was free, she hugged Which Samphire and then gave him a diamond ring from her hand. Sapphi- Samphire dons the ring and tells her, Come. I'll, and I'll take you to your father. He leads her to his boat, and they uh, hop in it and start to row. <laughs> There's totally <laughs> some guys waiting for me. They totally didn't ditch me. After a few they hours passed, me. they spotted a ship off in the distance, and Samphire signals it using his oar and the Princess Sophia's outer robe. The ship spotted them and took them aboard, and it was none other than the same ship that had abandoned Samphire. Uh, o- oops. <laughs> I know. Yeah, we we were circling around. We saw your signal. That's uh, why we uh, came back. No, you didn't have that fucking female robe with you before. Uh, we can nice clearly princess. see there's a bitch with you now. We meant for you to do that. Right. <clears throat> Where am I? Now that you've cut me yeah. What do you mean we don't like you? We <laughs> all love you, Sanfir. Okay, upon seeing Sanfir back with the princess, the captain says to them, Poor Sanfir Starboard, here we thought we had, you lost, we had lost you, and now, after looking all over for you, we see that you have returned with the king's daughter. <laughs> this calls for a real celebration. And the captain leads Sanfir to his cabin, and on the table inside were many bottles of wine. Samphire was so excited. He loves wine. <laughs> we lost you on that island we marooned you on. And he on. had not had any in some yeah. time. But come get drunk. It'll be okay. Well, they never gave him any because he didn't do any chores. <laughs> Little do you know, I'm an alcoholic. So all your sins are forgiven. <laughs> <laughs> he drank and drank until he fell unconscious onto the floor. Told you. <laughs> and then the captain said to Sophia, Don't you dare tell your father that this drunkard freed you. Tell him I freed you myself, since I am the captain of the ship, and I ordered him to rescue you. Princess Sophie, see, 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 Sophia, Sophia neither agreed nor disagreed. She said to him, ah. I know what I'll tell him. To be on the safe side, the captain decided to do away with Samphire once and for all. Once the princess was asleep late at night, they picked up Samphire, still drunk, as could be, and threw him into the sea. At dawn, the ship was in sight of port, and the captain gave the order to change the ship's flags to white to let the kingdom know that they had found Princess Sophia safe and sound. When they had finally got to port, they found a band playing and the king with his entire court waiting on the pier. A date was chosen for the Princess Sophia to wed the captain. Ladies and gentlemen, Van Halen! (laughs) (laughs) On the day of the wedding, the mariners in the port saw the man emerge from the sea. He was covered head to toe in seaweed, and as he emerged, his pockets had holes in them, and out swam little fishes and shrimp. Shrimp. The the man was none other than Samphire Starboard, just slightly more green. He walked out of the water and started to go into the kingdom, dragging behind him more seaweed. I brought all this kelp. I hope you don't mind. (laughs) It's a wedding gift. (laughs) He made it to the market where the wedding procession was moving through and came face to face with the man wreathed in seaweed. Everyone stops. The king was angered that the wedding had stopped and shouted at Samphire saying, Who is this? Seize him. (laughs) Kelpman. Crab people. (laughs) Crab people. Crab people. (laughs) The guards came up. The Samphire raised his hand, revealing the diamond ring on his finger. Check out this blade That sparkled in the sunlight. My daughter's ring, he explained the king. 
Sophia smiles and says, yes, father. This man is my rescuer and will be my husband. <laughs> I am banging that piece of ocean foliage. <laughs> <laughs> and you need to accept it, father. <laughs> Samphire tells the king the whole story and the king ordered the captain be imprisoned. The king demanded that the wedding resumed, so Samphire donned in seaweed, took his place next to Sophia, who was cladded in white, and they were joined in matrimony. Uh, the end. Fucking weird, right? Yeah. Kelpie <laughs> wedding. It's only going to get stranger. Yeah. <laughs> the it's, Italians did were she weird, eat it man. all off of him in the wedding night, you think? Most likely. D- undraped me and my seaweed. That probably took like six hours just yeah. to two. <laughs> By then, she was probably too tired. She's like, I'll see you in the morning. I'm not even going to bother with the blowjob. You need to clean up. You need to get a shower (laughs) or something. You are salty as fuck. All of your skin under that seaweed is all pruney. For real. We need to get some moisturizer. Yeah. You you need need some lotion. And you need a bath. (sighs) Like none other. Get the rose petals. Get the rose petals. The rosemary. Pocket. Let's keep rosemary. getting something else that's stronger. We need orange peel. We need garlic. Orange peel is a great degreaser, by the it way. Is. Yeah. It will help fucking lift those oils up. So if your dog gets skunked, people, use orange peel shit. Orange peel shit. If you don't have that, equal parts Eat baking soda, hydrogen peroxide, and water. Yeah. Fucking Christ. Quit bringing me your dogs like bathed in tomato juice. You know that shit fucking dyes their white coat pink? I like tomato dogs. I was just... I don't know how I got on this, but sorry. I know. Yeah, back to the Italian stories, <laughs> people. We got a little off You get a little dog rumor experience, yeah. too, at the same time. You need to know about dogs. Boom. Don't do that, people. Don't do that. Okay, so this one is a, is a bit longer of a story. Oh, a way, shit. a way longer story. Longer than sure? the Kelpman. Should we, do you want to take a quick... No, go for it. Let's get that Kelpman story in. The Kelpman? No, we just got the Kelpman story. In. Sorry. Yeah. Seaweed man. This one's called The Dragon with Seven Heads. Ooh. I'm already in. <clears throat> there once was a fisherman whose wife bore him no children. One oh. day, the fisherman took his nets to the nearby lake to fish, and he caught a big, beautiful fish. I think a ponyo at the time. Ponyo! The minute it was pulled out of the water, the fish began to beg the man to let it go, promising Please. in return to tell him about a excuse pond me, me. that was nearby, where I he could make a pond. much better haul and that it would take no time at all. Hearing the fish talk frightened the fisherman, and he didn't hesitate to free the fish. He leaves and goes <laughs> to the <Holy> pond <laughs> <laughs> the fish told him about, and in just two hauls, the fisherman has caught enough fish to fill his wagon. He was so pleased. A wagon full of fish. <laughs> I know, first thing he probably thought when it talked to him was, he just dropped it, was like, no more breakfast wine for me. <laughs> <laughs> I would definitely assume that. I'd be like, yeah. okay, I cannot do this anymore. It's funny, too. You say you imagine Ponyo. I imagine those, like, uh, uh, singing bass. That oh, people shit. Have on their <laughs> like he's just holding up the fish and it, <laughs> it just, just looks at him. And, yeah. It probably <laughs> was. But just Ain't like, nothing but a hound dog. We hold it for me. Uh-huh. We light it. No, I guess not. <laughs> he returns home where his wife sees how much fish he had caught. That's she insisted on knowing how he accomplished that. So... He told her all the details. His story pissed her off. She yells at him. (laughs) (coughs) You fucking lazy fat fuck. How could you let such a fine fish get away? Be sure to catch it tomorrow and bring it home. I intend to prepare it in a stew. And I need that fish to satisfy my cravings. Jesus. It's obviously a sentient creature you know this bitch says uh she's never been pregnant before she, i don't feel like she knows what a fucking craving is that that is a hardcore craving. i think she's been taking it up the butt and i thought i was so gonna mad. murder you when you told me i couldn't have chicken alfredo that one yeah. day i was like bitch think, no you didn't i think that uh <laughs> she's been taking it up the butt they're doing it wrong and this that, isn't Korea. that's why she's so mad 
This isn't Korean. Because that's why she's so angry. He comes home and he's like, well, babe, a talking fish told me. And I caught all these fish. Want to have some sex? Like, no, I don't want to fucking have sex. (laughs) Uh, To please his wife, the fisherman returned to the lake the next day. (laughs) Just going to keep going. (laughs) Don't want to reply to you. He, He cast his nets and pulled up the talking fish. Again, the talking fish begged and pleaded with the fisherman, telling him of another pond that was close by, too. I'm so sorry, sorry. And so again, the fisherman threw the talking fish back into the water and went Ah. to the new pond and caught a shitload of fish. It was a splendid haul indeed. Indeed. And when he returned to his wife, she flew off the handles. Puts you her hands on her baby hips dick. and cursed her Mommy's husband out. boy, son of a bitch. I should have married your brother because he's the only real man in your goddamn family. He has three teeth. You only have three what? teeth, <laughs> you dirty no, three-toothed <laughs> retard son of a bitch. I shouldn't say that word, but it's her who's saying it. So She says to him, you dumb ox, blockhead. Can't you see you're, that you're cursed with luck? How can you turn your back on it? Either bring me that fish tomorrow or you'll be sorry you didn't. Is that clear? You'll be eating goat taint for the rest of your life. <laughs> Jesus. That is disturbing thought. I like to imagine her just real <laughs> mean to him, too. He's just trying so hard. Babe, I, my I brought home some fish for us. You little pencil dick bitch boy. Jesus, do you think she was that cruel? Oh, yeah. Fuck. You mean while while I'm back here all day, by, I'm back here at home, fucking Larry the neighbor, and, and you, I mean, doing housework, and you've only come home with this much fish, you little son of a, a bitch. A fuck ton of fish? <laughs> but you couldn't bring me home the talking fish? I want that talking bass <clears throat> to go on my wall in my man cave. All right, so we're just going to keep going. Okay. Had dawn, the fisherman found himself back on the lake. He cast his nets and pulled them up, and again, there was the big, beautiful fish. Oh, scoozy, scoozy. Unfortunately, yeah. <laughs> all his begging and pleading fell on deaf ears. The fisherman ran straight home, and his wife took that fish and that was still alive, begging, still begging. Please, uh, please, I, be- I beg. And she threw I it beg, into yeah. a tub of fresh water. Ah. They stood there admiring the fish for a moment (laughs) and then discussed how they were going to cook it. At that, the fish poked its head up out of the water and said, Since I can't get out of dying, may I at least tell you my dying wishes? The fisherman and his wife consented, and the fish said, When I am dead, cook and... When I am dead, cooked and halved, let the woman eat my meat, the mare, horse, drink my broth... And give the dog my head. Plant the three biggest fish bones in the garden and hang my gallbladder from the beam in the kitchen. You will have children. Should any of them come to grief or harm, blood will ooze from my gallbladder. Hang my bladder in your kitchen. After killing and cooking the fish, the couple followed the fish's instructions to the T. Then it came to pass that the woman, mare, and dog gave birth all three on the same day. The dog had three puppies, all identical. The mare had three colts, all identical. And the woman gave birth to three identical baby boys. What? All nine were given different emblems tied around their necks to help identify who was who. As for the fish bones in the garden, they sprouted up into three fabulous swords. And when the children grew into young men, their father gave each son a horse, a dog, a sword, and as a present from himself, a shotgun. And in no time. Yeah, that's the dad. <laughs> Here's all this shit that they gave you, but you know what I got for you, kid? Sawed off 12 gauge. Fuck all this sword shit. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they became avid bird hunters, too, and shit. And that, that was a big thing. Bird! Really. Bird hunting, yeah. In no time, the eldest boy grew weary of living at home and in poverty and decided to go out and seek his fortune. He mounted his horse, took his dog, sword, and shotgun, and bid everyone farewell. Bon voyage. To his brothers, he said, Shall the gallbladder hanging from the beam uh, uh, from the beam, ever ooze blood? Come in search of me, for I will either be dead or in serious trouble. 
and away he galloped. And away he go. <laughs> After riding for days and days through unfamiliar territory, he came to the gates of a big city draped in mourning. He entered it and found all the citizens grief-stricken and dressed in black. Uh, he found an inn and went inside, and he asked the innkeeper for a room and dinner, and then inquired as to why the city was in mourning. The innkeeper explained that there is a dragon with seven heads who comes down to the bridge every day at noon, and if he is not given a maiden to eat, he will enter the city and devour everyone in its path. Lots are drawn daily. Today's chosen victim is the king's own daughter, the princess Gianluca. Gianluca. The king has posted a pro proclamation that anyone that rescues her will be wed to her and inherit the kingdom. Oh, shit. That's, uh, that's a score. I'm going to say anyone. Any man. Any man that rescues her. <laughs> Any man who rescues her. In my mind, I only automatically said anyone that rescues her. Anyway. I mean, it is such a weird thing to me, too, because now, you know, especially like the age we live in, you know, it's like, please rescue my daughter. Oh, thank you for rescuing my daughter. I appreciate your service. No one is ever like, rescue my daughter yeah. and you can bang her. Not only that, but you can have the entire kingdom that ah, comes take with my it. house too. inherit this. You know yes. what? Take it. Take it after. <laughs> Uh, so the eldest son, shit, let's call him Giorgio. 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 You got this. He says, there must be some way to save the princess Gianluca and free the city from the sc this scourge. And scourge. give me a piece of ass, am I right, boys? I have a powerful sword, gun, dog, and horse, <laughs> and, or not and, but would you mind taking me to the king? <laughs> sword, dog, gun, and horse. I'm pretty high, sorry. This joint's That's out. That's called high mythology for <laughs> a reason. Sorry. It's okay. Lost. Keep smoking and reading. You can do so, it. So, <clears throat> the innkeeper leads him to the king, and Giorgio asks the king for permission Giorgio. to confront and slay the dragon. The king says, you brave young man, please note that many, many men before you have tried and lost their lives. The poor wretches. But if you feel like risking your life to conquer the dragon you will have my daughter and my kingdom after my death of course <laughs> undaunted Giorgio took his dog Giorgio. his horse and went to sit and wait at the bridge horse dog sword gun all the things you need close to the stroke of twelve the princess Gianluca approached wearing all black accompanied by her ladies in waiting when they were halfway across the bridge, the ladies turned back in tears, leaving Gianluca by herself. She looked around and saw a man sitting on the bridge with his dog and says to him, Noble sir, what are you doing here? Didn't you know that there is a dragon coming any moment to, de uh, to devour me? He will eat you too if he finds you here. Giorgio smiles at her and says, I am well aware of that. I am aware. I've come to set you free and marry you. Gianluca replies, my poor man, flee or the dragon will have two souls to devour today instead of just me. The dragon is full of wiles. He's How do you expect to one. slay him? From just looking at Princess Gianluca, Giorgio fell deeply in love with her and says to her, for the sake of your love, I will risk my life and what will be will be. And I have a fucking shotgun. He's a dragon. They're not at all used to shotguns. <laughs> <laughs> he's oh, used to fighting call. guys like, with swords. Kind of I'm just going to shotgun during him. the dragon ages, man. How is that? Yeah. I didn't even think about that. Shit. He's fighting a gun. I've never seen a movie with, with a yeah. fucking someone fighting a dragon with a gun. That's something we need to do. Uh, rather than Rain of Fire. but That's going to be great. Yeah. Oh. Oh, yeah. That was such a great movie. That was a great movie. We got to re rewatch that one. Yeah. That was a great one. Anyway, <laughs> so uh, suddenly the earth began to shake and a chasm opened and out popped the dragon chasm. with seven heads, all breathing smoke and fire. The dragon made straight for the princess and in a flash, Giorgio was on his horse. He sticks his dog on the dragon and charges <laughs> his horse at it. He took out his sword and uh, epically took off six of the seven heads on the dragon. The last dragon's head asked if they could rest for a moment, and Giorgio was out of breath, too, so he agreed to Break. stop fighting for just a moment. Break time. Time out. Time out. Time out. 
Time out. Time. Let's take a fiver. I think I pulled Two a minutes. hammy. Two minutes. I pulled. I, I, yeah, I definitely pulled a hammy. Give me a minute to <laughs> stretch it out. <laughs> uh, the dragon lowered his head and began rubbing his head on the ground. And as he mm. raised his head, the other six heads reattached. In seeing that, Giorgio realized that he had to take out all seven heads at once. So Giorgio rushed to the dragon, swinging around his sword like a ninja, until every single head was cut off. And then he took his sword and cut out all seven dragon tongues. Dragon he asked tongues. Gianluca if she, he, uh, she had a handkerchief, which he could have, and she did, so she gives it to him. He wraps the tongues in with it and leave, leaves her there thinking, and goes back to the inn to thinking, wash his, for the, his visit to the king. I'm thinking they're, they're, they're pretty small dragons. I think he pretty much killed like seven iguanas. Because <laughs> if you think about it, like if they're small enough where he's like, give me one handkerchief to hold all seven tongues. Yeah, right. That's what I was thinking, too. I'm uh, like, maybe he just took like the corner slide. Yeah, they're just lizards. I guess they're one of the side of the time. <laughs> we must feed her to the dragon gods to appease them. That's. That's like a Pokemon uh, family size, of a, yeah. iguanas. They're not going to do anything. You know that, right? It's like the size of a Pyrenees. Yeah. That's not very... <laughs> a kimono dragon, maybe. Oh, like maybe. Like that, yeah, but yeah. there wasn't any of those. Like a mini one like that? Like a mini Hydra? Oh, maybe they were and they killed them. Huh? Oh, shit. He needed to look good. Fuck yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so he went home to visit and left the princess there. But so, uh, <clears throat> unfortunately for Giorgio, in a hovel near the bridge lived a very sly and wicked coal man who Coleman. had witnessed the combat from afar. He thinks to himself, what idiot leaves the proof of killing the dragon on the ground like that? Ooh, sorry. I must take advantage of this. And so he gathered the amputated heads into a bag and Coleman. ran to the king. Holding a huge knife smeared in the dragon's blood. <clears throat> he says, Your Majesty, here before you stands the dragon slayer, and these are the seven heads which I have cut off one by one with the knife you see here. Therefore, Your Highness, you must keep your royal promise and give me your daughter's hand in marriage. The king was taken aback by the sight of this coal man's ugly and sinister face. Coleman? He was not convinced of the truth of the man's story, and suspecting strongly that Giorgio had been devoured, and that the coal man had shown up at the last minute when the dragon was already done for and dealt only the final blow. Regardless, the royal promise could not be altered, and the king was obligated to reply, If that's how it really happened, then my daughter Gianluca is yours. And at that, the princess Gianluca had been in the audience hall listening to the conversation, began screaming at the coal man, calling him a liar, that it wasn't him that slayed the dragon, but a young man who would arrive any minute. A heated quarrel followed, but the coal man stuck with his story and presented the seven dragon heads as evidence. The king could not dispute it and had no choice but to tell his daughter to calm the fuck down and get ready to be <laughs> married. Chill, girl. Chill. <laughs> right it's, away. It's still like, it's like 1200 A.D., 1400 AD, so you're still not allowed to talk that much. Right away, the king ordered the announcement to be made public. Uh, three days were devoted to festivities, with a grand banquet on each day. At the end of it all, the wedding will be held, and in the meantime, Giorgio arrived at the royal palace, but the guards at the front door refused to let him in under any circumstances. And in the same instant, he heard the town crier go through the city square announcing the forthcoming wedding of Princess Gianluca to the coal man. Coleman! Grab me, grab me something Keep. in the fridge. Coleman! Here. One second. Keep, take this, keep, keep take this ad. Keep talking. Keep talking. <laughs> no. <laughs> but, uh... Giorgio argued in vain to be taken to the king. But alas, the guards were not moved, and finally the coal man appeared and ordered Giorgio thrown out. Giorgio had no choice but to return to the inn. 
Poor Giorgio. You must have returned to the inn. Hold on. Open this for me real quick. I'm sorry. I'm all... I'm parched. It's the best part. You love this part. I <laughs> Had to slow down a minute. Came in fake to fuck everybody. I need munchies and soda. Cotton <laughs> Where's the Tootsie Rolls? And the Let me see that Tootsie Roll. Okay, let's let's hear it. That is like drinking a orange ice pop. It's interesting. Anyway. Uh, Giorgio had no choice but to return to the inn. He was seething in rage, but he needed to find a way to prevent that marriage, expose the Coleman's lie, and establish himself as the true dragon slayer. At court, the tables were laid and all the nobility was invited. Seated next to the princess Gianluca was the coal man, dressed in velvet. And since he was short in stature, seven cushions were placed under him to make him look taller. <laughs> you little fuck. <laughs> Aww. Oh, little tiny little guy. <laughs> I'm a big guy and I slayed dragons. Sure you did. Sure you did, coal Say man. Say that to Tyrion, okay? He was epic. Well, I didn't call him a dwarf or midget or anything like that. I just think he's a regular short dude. <laughs> but like me, like I'm just fucking. What's what's the definition of short though? Like four foot. I I don't know where you hit the cutoff. But where is the cutoff the, for if you? You're on the north. You're like a Viking though. You're six one. Fuck so yeah, I'm six two. Six two. You keep taking an inch off. Piece of shit. Piece of shit. <laughs> you don't understand how hard it is to reach the damn top shelf. Yes, I love the top shelf. It makes me relevant. <laughs> the top shelf keeps tall people relevant. Remember that, <laughs> folks. After racking his brain, Giorgio awoke his dog, sleeping at his feet, and says, Listen faithfully. Or, not listen faithfully. Listen, listen faithful. faithful. <laughs> listen faithful. Run to the palace and find the princess Gianluca. Make a fuss over her and her alone. And when the banquet is ready to sit down to eat, upset the table and flee. But be careful not to get caught. The dog, who understood everything his master said to him, ran off and found the princess. He put his paws on her Good lap, boy. whined and licked her face. She recognized the dog and was glad to see him. But the coal man was sitting next to the princess and became suspicious of the dog. So he ordered it to be driven out of the banquet hall. Oh, the soup had just finished being served and the dog caught hold of the corner of the tablecloth and pulled it clean off the table with everything on it. Then the dog flew off the stairs so fast that no one could catch him or even see which way he went. The confusion of the guests was too much for words that the banquet had to be called off. Coleman started crying. It was somewhat of a scandal. the size of a child. <laughs> <laughs> when the second banquet came up, Giorgio said to his dog, Go back, faithful, and do the same thing over. Seeing the dog back, the princess Gianluca laughed with joy, but the coal man was fearful and suspicious. He insisted that the dog be driven out with a whip. And Gianluca, however, stood up for the dog, and the coal man, in spite of his meanness, dared not defy her. Just like last time, after the soup was served, the dog grabbed hold of the tablecloth and pulled everything onto the floor, and then fled like lightning. The guards and servants tore after him, but he was out of sight, before anyone knew what had hit them. On the early evening of the third banquet, Giorgio told his dog, go back, faithful, and do the same thing once more, but this time, let them follow you back home to me. The dog did as he was told, and uh, the guards were led straight to Giorgio, who was Giorgio. seized and brought before the king. Ah, oh, ciao, Giorgio. The king recognized and said to Giorgio, but aren't you the young man who wanted to rescue my daughter from the dragon? Georg I am. Giorgio nods. I certainly am. Your majesty. And I rescue her, I did. At those words, the coal man shouted, It's not so. I killed the dragon with my own two hands. And to prove I'm an it, adult. I brought I along the adult. seven heads. <laughs> <laughs> I'm taller than some people. <laughs> wow. He ordered for the seven dragon heads to be brought before them, and without losing his cool, Giorgio turned to the king and said, Maybe he brought you the he seven heads, but they were so heavy, so I only took their tongues. 
<laughs> Let us look in those seven mouths and see if there is a tongue in each one, shall we? I do not have the spare time that someone as tiny and ugly as he has. <laughs> <laughs> so the seven tongues were indeed missing, and then Giorgio pulled out his pack, the handkerchiefs, in which he had wrapped them in and Check described tongues, the combat in full detail. The coal man refused to accept the defeat and claiming that the tongues would have to be put back into place to be sure that they fit. <laughs> I'm so every a time, powerful warrior. Every time a tongue fit perfectly, the coal man would throw a cushion from under his chair around the room. <laughs> when the last tongue went back, uh, back in, the coal man disappeared under the table and fled. <laughs> but he was caught at once and was hung by order of the king in the town square. Hang him low, because <laughs> he's so short. <laughs> uh, now in the highest of spirits, the king, bride, and groom, and the guests sat down for a feast and concluded the wedding. Then night fell, and everyone went to bed. At dawn, Giorgio awoke and opened the window. And in seeing a forest full of birds before him, felt the urge to go hunting. His wife begged him not to go because the forest was enchanted and whoever went in did not come out. For some reason, the more Giorgio heard, the more he was tempted by the danger. So he took his horse, dog, sword, and gun and departed and already shot. And he departed. <laughs> and he departed. Moss munchies, por favor. On a quest. You're having it to zero? No, I can't. No, I can't. Oh, Terrible. Yeah. Munchies. <laughs> Got pushed through. It's the endurance trial time. <sighs> it's the fucking eye of the tiger over here. Think about the crowd, the people at home listening. Hear them cheer you on. Are they? They're not. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. He had already shot many birds when suddenly a huge storm presented itself. Thunder and lightning and rain by the barrels. Giorgio was soaking wet and had gotten himself lost. He found a cave and took shelter. It was full of white marble statues in various postures. But Giorgio paid them no attention and he gathered some wood and, and lit a fire to dry his clothes and cook the birds. And after a short moment, an old woman entered the cave seeking shelter. She was drenched through and through. I'm so wet right now. Her teeth chattered and begged Giorgio to let her warm herself by the fire. She was smoking a Virginia Slim <laughs> cigarette. <laughs> had, a, had a deep throaty voice. Hey there, big boy. Wow. How have you been? Wow. <laughs> I can't imagine. Yeah. Mm, yeah, I only smoke the Virginia Slims because they're good for my figure. <laughs> Dude, you sound like uh, that one chick from uh, Avenger Brothers. That's awesome. <laughs> her teeth were chattering and begged Giorgio to let her warm herself by the fire. Giorgio says, by all means, ma'am, you can keep me company. And the old woman oh, sat yeah, down baby. and offered Giorgio salt for the roasting birds, bran for the horse, a bone for the dog, and grease to repair oh. his sword. <laughs> He offered her a bone for the dog, if you know what I mean. I'm sure. As soon as Giorgio, his horse and dog, and the sword was greased, they all turned. <laughs> <laughs> I think I wrote that wrong. Okay, so as soon as Giorgio, his horse and his dog ate, and the sword was greased, they all turned into marble statues. Waiting in vain for her husband to return, Princess Gianluca gave him up for dead. And so the grief-stricken king ordered the city to be draped in mourning. Meanwhile, back at the fisherman's house, from the time Giorgio had left, his father and brothers looked daily at the gallbladder hanging in the kitchen. Look at that fucking gallbladder. It's just... <laughs> it's, it's been hanging out there quite a long time, right, Dad? No. Only their whole life. Only their whole life. One day, <laughs> what's the story behind this gallbladder, pops? <laughs> they found the kitchen flooded with blood coming out the gallbladder. At that, the second-born son David said, "My big brother David. is in, is either dead or something terrible has happened to him. Farewell." Why is there all of this uh, gall gallbladder blood just into my kitchen? 
He mounted his horse and took his dog, sword, and shotgun and galloped off. Along the way, David would stop Ciao. and ask people, have you seen a man who looks exactly like me right through here? Everybody would laugh and say, that's a fine joke. Aren't you the same one who rode through here some time ago? <laughs> so David realizes that his brother had definitely gone this way. He eventually came to the royal city, and I when sh- the citizens dressed in black saw him, they were overjoyed. I feel so bad for that dude. Yeah. Like, no one understands. Like, everywhere he goes, he has to explain what identical twins are to people, and they're just like, nah! <laughs> no, that doesn't fucking exist. fucking with me, man. I remember <laughs> you. You were fucking with me last time, too. <laughs> oh. oh, shit. And so the... <laughs> They were overjoyed, saying, here he is, here he is. He's not dead after all. Hooray. Hoorah. Long live our prince. Long live the prince. They led him in before and the king. And his horse dog shotgun. Before sword. the king, Gianluca, and the king's court. And they all mistook him for Giorgio. The king scolded him at great lengths for going off. And, but Davi pretended not to be puzzled and apologized and even made up with Gianluca. Oh, sorry, sorry. He handled all the questions scusi, carefully scusi. and was able to learn all about his brother, his marriage, and his disappearance. That night, while going to bed, David told Gianluca that they would sleep with the sword between them for the night. <laughs> she didn't understand why, but still agreed, and they went to sleep. He, too, arose at dawn and opened the window right away, seeing the forest before him. He says, I will go hunt there. Gianluca instantly freaked out, said, isn't one narrow escape enough for you? (laughs) Really, dude? What are you doing out there? Must I suffer from even more anxiety? I got got to go out to the forest. There's a thing I have to do. Her words fell on deaf ears and Davi left with horse, dog, sword, and gun. Horse, dog, sword, and gun. Unfortunately, he was met with the same fate as Giorgio. Yeah, he he oiled his sword with that old lady. And was to remain in the cave as a statue. Mm -hmm. Let me oil your sword, (laughs) big boy. (laughs) Come over here and let me oil it real quick. Right. Again, waiting in vain for her husband to return, Gianluca felt certain that he was dead. And once more, the city was put into mourning by order of the king. Meanwhile, back at the fisherman's house, the kitchen was newly flooded with blood pouring from the gallbladder. (laughs) Jesus, this gallbladder blood (laughs) is everywhere. (laughs) And the youngest brother... Antonio Antonio set out at once in search of his brothers, taking his horse, dog, sword, and gun. I must he go set for out. my brothers. He too inquired along the way, asking people, "Did you see two young men who each look exactly like me riding you through son here?" Son of a bitch! The people you laughed, son saying, of a bitch with your "What jokes. a clown you are!" <laughs> <laughs> you asshole! Every time you just come through with the same joke. No, see, the thing is, sometimes people have babies and all of their babies look exactly the same that's what you would say you trickster son of a bitch <laughs> but he had the same horse the same yeah. dog the same shotgun uh, you got you that know shotgun. what i mean they all looked identical like in every sense of the purpose they probably uh, all carried they were probably all left-handed you know what i mean they all had the same clothes from their mom exactly you son of a bitch with that every time. Nope, twins. It's you just have like twins? a different colored feather on your hat and nobody notices. Nobody notices the simple shit. You know what I mean? Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. Just, just crying yeah. out in vain. Sorry. I have a birthmark. I am Antonio. I am <laughs> not defeat. <laughs> so the people would laugh saying, what a clown you are. Are you going to continue to come by asking the same thing? You silly Antonio fucker. knew he was on the right path. So he kept going until he reached the city, where he was joyously welcomed back as if he had just risen from the dead. And again, he too was taken before the king, princess, and the king's court. And, and again, was mistook for Giorgio. Ah, Giorgio, good And to just see like you back. David did, David, David did, David. when they all went to bed for the night, he put a sword between them, uh, him and Gianluca. No funny business, Gianluca. Then, at dawn again, seeing the forest at the, from the window, Antonio announced, I'm going hunting. I'm going to die there. Princess Gianluca was thrown into a state of dismay, telling him, 
Are you bent on going to your doom? Do you even love me? Okay. Every time you go out hunting, I'm worried to death about you. I am butt ass naked, and you put a fucking razor sharp sword in between us every night. Dude, Antonio is stone cold. You just wait. I'm a stone cold fucker. But Antonio <laughs> was dying to be off in search of his brothers and left immediately, taking shelter in the same came in the same cave out of the sudden storm. He explained. He examined the statues one by one and recognized his two brothers. He says to himself, there's mischief here for sure. He cut an inch off of both of their pieces. <laughs> <laughs> I shall watch my step. He had just lit a fire and put his birds on to roast when mm, the old woman appeared. And, birds. and bowing before Antonio, she asked to warm herself by the fire. But Antonio scowled at her saying, out of my way, you ugly witch. I want you nowhere near me. Hey, you mind if I warm myself by your fire? It's no. very cold over here. I'm a little wet. If you know <laughs> what I mean. <laughs> Get out of here, old lady. Appearing hurt by I such a welcome. I am the gay welcome. brother. Ha-ha! <laughs> wow. Appearing hurt by such a welcome, the old woman said, Have you no love for fellow human being? I would still like to give you a few little things to improve your supper. Salt for the roasted birds, bran for the horse, a bone for the dog, and grease to keep your sword from rusting in this weather. <laughs> I just want to grease your sword, big it's, boy. Uh, it's going to rust out here in yeah. the water, you know. <laughs> wow. <laughs> he pounced on her like a cat, throwing her <laughs> to the ground, uh, holding her down with no. his knee and gripping her throat with his left hand. He unsheathed his sword with his right, and he pressed the point of the sword to her neck. Snarling, he said, Awful, on my own sword. <laughs> awful old witch, give me back my brothers, or I'll slit your throat this instant. The old woman protested that she would never harm a soul. But Antonio wasn't buying it and pressed his sword lightly into her windpipe. She finally confessed to her witchcraft and promised to obey him if he spared her life. She pulled out a jar of salt from her pocket and told him that it will restore the statues to life. You just have to rub them down first. <laughs> you just gotta rub them down. I'm gonna sit over here and smoke my Virginia Slims and watch. <laughs> <laughs> um... <laughs> wow. yeah, I just floored you with that one, didn't I? You did. Ah, oh, she I pulls like out the her way you're rubbing them down with that salve I gave you. It's so, just some Vicks Vapor Rub I got at the store. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> Antonio wasn't about to let her go, and with his sword pointed against her back, he forced her to daub the statues. Daub it, One bitch. by one. The statues returned to living people, and the cave was soon crowded with living people. Party time. When the brothers saw each other, they joyfully embraced, and all of them, the other men were speechless with gratitude towards Antonio for freeing them. I like to imagine that, like, David is the brother, too, that always makes the same joke that annoys the other two. He probably is. Like, every is. time they see each other, am I looking in a mirror or is it what? That, should we just God call him Bestie? David. Just oh, <laughs> burn. I'm just kidding. You're gonna need to get some burn gel for that one, folks. Well, maybe you can ask the fucking cackling I'll woman for some cackling. fucking KY jelly hey, for can you. I, can you get, I got some burn gel for you. I always carry burn gel around in case I drop my Virginia Slims down into my crotch area. I bet. <laughs> During the commotion, the witch was slipping away, but the brothers saw her Ops, and ran up on her with their swords, and they cut her into pieces. Ouch. The, sp <laughs> <laughs> that was great. Uh, the spell on the, fo uh, the forest was completely broken, and as suddenly as the storm came, it disappeared. Giorgio carefully pocketed the jar of salve that brings people back to life. Yoink. Upon returning to the royal city, the brothers were talking, and they told one another what had happened to them. At the news that the brothers had <laughs> slept with the princess Gianluca, Giorgio was seized with rage and jealousy that he took out his sword and killed them both. 
No sooner had Giorgio committed the crime that he quickly repented and turned his weapon oh, no. upon himself. Why did I kill my brothers? The other nobleman restrained him, and then Giorgio remembered the jar of salve in his pocket. He treated the dead brothers' wounds, and then they up they stood again, alive and well. Overjoyed, overjoyed, Giorgio, overjoyed, Giorgio. Overjoyed, overjoyed, Giorgio begged his brothers for their forgiveness, which they oh, granted. Please, I forgave me. <sighs> sorry. I'm sorry. And then uh, so David and Antonio explained the sword in the middle of the bed, which they did not have the chance to say earlier. We only did hand stuff, brother. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the sword. That would have hurt if you could. No, you just reach over the sword. That's yeah, harder. You got to keep it up. You know what I mean? After a while, you don't want to just kind of fucking just limp there. <laughs> you like to rest your elbow. You need to rest your elbow. You don't want to follow the sword. Yeah, exactly. Uh, the three of them continued on to the palace, and they called Princess Gianluca, who had nearly cried her eyes out. Seeing the triplets, she could not for the life of her tell which was which man was her husband. <laughs> oh, God. You know what I like to imagine, too? Was it's it? them on their way back running into the people that they asked. <laughs> and then just them being the type of assholes, too, who are looking at each other. Just totally not acknowledging them. Like, oh, no, it's called triplets. I heard about it from someone who was passing through once. <laughs> <laughs> I knew the uh, whole time. <laughs> Giorgio identifies himself and introduces his brothers to her. The king marries uh, David and Antonio off to two daughters of noblemen, mm -hmm. and they named him them a part of his court. Mm -hmm. The king even invited the fisherman and his wife to live at the palace. Nice. The end. Yep. I think I still think David was gay, and I think that's what saved him. Do you want to do? Oh. But, uh, oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. No. The, okay. So that's yeah. That's kind of a. Awesome ending, though. That's a happy ending for them. All three brothers got some. Mm -hmm. And the family even got the fisherman family got to come back. Yeah, they just moved out of poverty all because of this fish. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Chance, I, luck, the, got to defeat a dragon, get a hot it, princess. The sad part of it is. What's it? They still had to live with that lady. Oh, god damn. Because you know they brought her to the castle and she's like, You call this a castle? This isn't even a castle. <laughs> fucking Carl, that I send that you off to fish every day, and you tell me, finally, we're going to live in a fucking castle, and you bring me to this fucking thing. It's barely three stories. Oh. Carl, I hate you. You're going bald. I saw that in, like, <laughs> this one tiny build house <laughs> episode. Oh, poor, poor guy. But, you know, they ate that poor talking fish that never hurt anyone. So. Those Karens exist, man. Exactly. They even exist yeah. in those oh, times. Oh, you met a talking fish and you didn't bring it home so I could fucking consume its soul? For real, no, Karen. No, I didn't, honey. I just thought you would be interesting to know that I met a talking fish and he said, we never have to work hard again because he'll take care of us. I want to fucking eat that fish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh why we have a hundred other fish but they don't taste like they have souls yeah i want to taste something that has a soul so it's either I you bring me that away. or we eat you you decide <laughs> carl <laughs> he could teach sorry me honey <laughs> wow okay yeah uh yeah all of our references came from italian folk tales 1980 by Italio Calvino. I think I got that right. Italo Calvino. Italo Calvino. Ah, ciao, ciao. I got those names down, man. Yeah, you do. You got that Italian. Tell people. Sono stanco tell people, tua thank merda. you for listening <laughs> in no. Italian. I have no idea. Italian. I <laughs> thank you for listening. Oh, shit. <laughs> yeah. I get you on the next one. I can't think on the uh, spot. I'm too stoned for that shit. Well, folks, you got me. You got me. We have come to the end of our journey this evening. Uh, I really hope you enjoyed it. I hope you had a fun time. Um, as always, 
Let us know what you think. Uh, shout out in the comments. Yell it at us next time you see us or from your windows. We're always listening. Uh, also, drop us suggestions. Let us know what you want to hear. Grazie. We'll do it. Grazie. 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 Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, drop a like and subscribe. That shit helps us. Uh, all the thumbs up in the world are just uh, good things for us. So, yeah. Uh, we love you. And good night. Have a good night.